Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to all of the St. Luke's cardiology alumni to the Miles J. Schwartz Memorial Lecture. It is my distinct honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Judith Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman graciously agreed to give this memorial lecture in honor of our dear former program director, our colleague and our friend, Dr. Miles J. Schwartz, who passed away last year. I understand that for most of you in the room, Dr. Hoffman needs no introduction. She is a legend in the world of cardiology and has served as a teacher and mentor to many of us here today. But for those of you who do not know Dr. Hoffman, please allow me to introduce her to you. Judith Hoffman is Senior Associate Dean for the Clinical Sciences, Co-Director of the NYU HHC Clinical and Translational Science Institute, the Harold Snyder Family Professor of Medicine and Associate Director of the Leon Charney Division of Cardiology and Director of the Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center at NYU Langone Health. Dr. Hoffman holds a master's degree in cellular and developmental biology from Harvard University and an MD from Harvard Medical School. She is an internationally recognized clinical trialist and an expert in ischemic heart disease, having served as study chair for several NHLBI-funded international clinical trials. Dr. Hoffman served on several writing committees for the US and international practice guidelines and on the NHLBI Board of External Experts, on the ACC AHA Task Force for Clinical Practice Guidelines, on the AHA Strategic Advisory Coordinating Committee, and on the FDA Cardiovascular and Renal Drugs Advisory Committee. Dr. Hoffman has authored over 300 publications, reviews, and chapters in major international cardiovascular medical journals and textbooks. In addition, she was senior guest editor for, Cardio for Circulation and currently on the editorial board of Circulation, JAK, JAMA Cardiology, the European Heart Journal, and the American Heart Journal. Dr. Hoffman is a proud recipient of numerous awards from the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and other organizations. We were privileged to have Dr. Hoffman work with us at St. Luke's Hospital when she was director of the cardiac care unit. It was while under Dr. Hoffman, while Dr. Hoffman was at St. Luke's Hospital, that she got her grant in the for NHLBI grant for the shock trial. This trial was a world-renowned trial demonstrating the benefits of early revascularization for patients in cardiogenic shock. This trial conclusively demonstrated this. Hoffman then went on to lead the NHLBI-funded O trial, another landmark trial demonstrating the lack of benefit in opening of persistently occluded arteries three to 28 days after MMI. And these two trials were really, for those of us who are cardiologists know, these two trials were groundbreaking, and each trial led to major changes in the U.S. and European guidelines for coronary revascularization. She is now study chair of the NHLBI-funded International Ischemia Trial, and we look forward to the, for the reports of this study to be recorded within the next year. Today, Dr. Hoffman will incorporate all of the data from her extensive clinical research and outline to us the management of patients with ischemic heart disease across the entire spectrum of disease. Welcome to Dr. Hoffman. Thanks so much, Jackie. That was fantastic. Um, I keep wondering who it is that they're introducing when you know when I, get, I, I get introduced. Anyway, it's just wonderful to be back um, to see so many. Uh, I don't. I can't say old friends and colleagues. It just doesn't sound right. So, you know, friends and colleagues from the past, uh, some of who I've kept up with, and some of whom I'm just seeing now for the first time in many, many, many years. And it's amazing, everybody looks unchanged, right? So um, I, here, here are my conflicts of interest, um, which uh, are really not directly uh, uh, relevant. Um, so I'm here really to remember and honor Miles Schwartz, who was the director of the clinical cardiology training program here for 30 years. And most importantly, he was not only a dedicated and master educator and, and clinician, but he was the heart and soul of the division. So when I, you know, arrived here, sort of recruited by Harvey Kent, it was all, but it was all about Miles, really. 
Um, and uh, we got to be friends and colleagues, and I uh, respected him and admired him tremendously. And we'll get into that more. I will hear about him, more about him at the memorial service. But one of the things that Miles uh, did that directly affected me was he recruited outstanding fellows. So I had the opportunity to work with people here, work with fellows on projects that then led to publications and to some to have academic careers. So what I've, what I've, what I've done is sort of take advantage of this lecture and kind of stroll down memory lane. I looked through my CV and I selected some that would fit on two slides. And here are, well, Venu appears on uh, lots of these. Um, and some that are not here, Venu, you're on a bunch of the, the shock ones. And then other major contributions actually that were made um, with fellows doing research was actually establishing a new target range for unfractionated heparin for acute coronary syndromes. The dose we use internationally now for acute MI with the 60 units was developed here based on looking at retrospective data. Uh, Lee, a fellow, Menon, um, a fellow, Jim Wilentz at the time, and then, um, oh, I don't see Andreas. Well, here, Andreas' uh, paper from, from Gusto. Andreas is here and uh, Venu with the new dosing uh, recommendations in the Green Journal. And then, of course, you know, with very talented uh, uh, Jackie, we had a New England Journal uh, paper. Yal, we got to work on some basic stuff with matrix vitelloproteinases. So it was a wonderful uh, experience for me here. And I was able to thrive uh, under Miles and, 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 and Harvey uh, Kemp. And they let me do my own thing. And I was able to, um, as you heard from Jack, you really accomplish a lot here, sort of unfettered and supported. So I'm going to take you through that journey of these three trials. And the unifying theme is what is the incremental role, the role of um, incremental role of revascularization added to medical therapy. So we'll talk about late revascularization after MI, which is really a bench to bedside story and takes me back to my uh, fellowship. We'll talk about emergency revascularization, cardiogenic shock complicating myocardial infarction. And then, as Jackie said, we'll talk about the ongoing ischemia trial, the role of revascularization in stable ischemic heart disease, which is a very large uh, population. So I've gone from the very sick to the very stable. So as I stroll down memory lane, I have to remember my mentor when I was a fellow at Johns Hopkins, Bernadine Healy, the first uh, female director of the National Institutes of Health president of the American Red Cross, dean of the um, Ohio uh, uh, State Medical School, um, and an inspiration to me. She had uh, described this entity of infarct expansion, thinning and dilation of the infarct zone, in contrast to infarct extension, which was new necrosis at the margin of the infarct, with a pathologist, Grover Hutchins, just before I had arrived on my fellowship. So you could see how old I am. And uh, uh, she asked me to set up a rat model of myocardial infarction because Mark Pfeffer had been doing this in, in Boston and her dog model was too unwieldy to get through and through transmural infarcts in dogs. You had to embolize dental gel found the coronary because they have rich collaterals. So this big interspecies variation in the amount of collaterals. The rats have very little collateral, so she wanted me to set up a rat model and somehow I was bold enough to say, okay, I'll set up a rat model for you. Um, and that's what we did, and I described infarct expansion, had a couple of uh, publications. And um, so just to remind you of the importance of infarct expansion, so you get an acute infarct. It expands, thins, and dilates over uh, really hours to days. That could be reversible with reperfusion, but it can be irreversible either with reperfusion or without reperfusion if it's, if it's uh, very, very late. And that leads to global remodeling over days to months. And why is that important? Well, end systolic volume was independently associated with risk of cardiac death, and this was already uh, elucidated in the late 1980s. We know that the bigger the ventricle, the greater the risk of sudden death post-MI. So it was an important process. So there I was, right out of fellowship, coming to St. Luke's, and it was St. Luke's at the time. We were not merged uh, with uh, Roosevelt. Uh, 
And uh, Bob Case was in charge of uh, sort of the basic research. And I got a grant. I think Jerry Torino may, may have been in charge of the institutional research funds. And there I see him in the second row. And I got some funds to set up a rat model of myocardial infarction, you know, up where the dog lab was. And I hired Haran Chu, who was uh, waiting, sort of uh, doing a post back, wanted to go to medical school. She's now a plastic surgeon. And uh, we worked up there in the bowels while I was director of the cardiac care unit and my other, uh, using my other hat. And um, you have to remember these days, uh, I'll, I'll recap for you sort of what era this was. We didn't even know that reperfusion saved lives at this point, right? So we were treating MIs like, you know, you go to bed and, 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 and we'll see how you do. So uh, I had hypothesized uh, then that early reperfusion in this model would reduce infarct size. And here's early reperfusion. And sure enough, it's a very small mid-myocardial infarct. Here is permanent occlusion in the rat. And that's a very large infarct with a lot of thinning of the infarct zone and dilation of the LV. But I also hypothesized that late reperfusion, too late to salvage any myocardium, would also help preserve the thickness of the myocardium and the, sh and the size of the left ventricle. And in fact, that was confirmed. This is all dead, but it's much thicker than permanent occlusion and the, the, the cavity size is smaller. And that was due to, to converting it from coagulation necrosis to contraction band necrosis. Uh, infarct stiffness was increased with uh, reperfusion and there was accelerated healing, about twice the healing rate. Instead of taking about six weeks in a human when you re to heal the infarct, when you reperfuse them, it's about three weeks. So what we now know, which we didn't know then, is that reperfusion improves survival in acute coronary syndromes, that early reperfusion saves lives in STEMI, PCI is superior to fibrinolysis um, in STEMI, and revascular sa revascularization saves lives in high-risk non-ST elevation MI. But what about late reperfusion, late opening of the infarct-related arteries post-MI? Well, we, we sort of said there are potential benefits. There could be less ischemia. There's better LV function in remodeling. I had proven that in the RAT model. And as Brownwald uh, postulated, that artery, if open, could then serve as a source for collaterals if other arteries go down, the other remote arteries go down. Of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch in medicine, so there are potential risks. There are PCI, peri-PCI complications. And it had interestingly been reported from Werner in Germany that you could take a total occlusion, asymptomatic patient, open it, and when they reoccluded, it was symptomatic with a myocardial infarction or sudden death. And the reason is you could not, when that reoccluded, could not quickly enough recruit the collateral flow that had been there previously. So there was a downside, and you'll see a signal of that in the results of OAT. And then, there's, of course, there's a cost to these procedures. So we hypothesized, and actually, this trial was done, uh, this hypothesis, the development of this trial was all done at St. Luke's. And I got this NIH grant at St. Luke's for a 320 site study. Um, um, and Lorraine Hansen supported it all. Uh, you probably don't know Lorraine Hansen, but was a tremendous administrator um, here. So a strategy of late PCI to open occluded infarct uh, uh, artery reduces, this is our hypothesis, the first occurrence of a composite of death reinfarction or New York Heart Association class for heart failure by 25% compared to optimal medical therapy alone. So it was a question of leaving this occluded if you presented late post-infarction, more than 24 hours post-infarction, versus opening it. And we took patients with the total occlusion, and they had to have, we didn't take low-risk patients. They had to have some risk factor for increased long-term risk of events, either an ejection fraction less than 50%, or proximal occlusion of a major epicardial vessel supplying at least 25% of the left ventricle. So these were not low-risk patients in terms of this variable. But they could not have rest or low threshold ischemia, angina, they could not have severe inducible ischemia, they couldn't have severe heart failure, or left main or triple vessel. So one or two vessel disease was fine. They were largely one vessel disease, um, but about 20% of two vessel disease. They were randomized to PCI with stent and medical therapy and medical therapy alone. 
And I'll remind you that this trial was conducted in the era of more intensive medical therapy than had previously been available, which has changed the biology and outcome of coronary disease with a relative risk reduction, just use of medical therapy of about 40% in terms of reducing the occurrence of the events. And my rats did not get medical therapy. But don't tell the people that might complain about that. But it wasn't the standard anyway. So we looked at um, not only short-term, but then we um, got another grant, looked at long-term follow-up um, with an average of six years of follow-up. And as you all know, PCI versus medical therapy alone for subacute total occlusions post-MI, uh, we did not meet our primary endpoint. The hazard ratio of PCI to med was 1.06, confidence intervals, and these are the curves. We did not have a lot of crossovers, okay? So only 12% of the medical therapy group over time had a PCI. And there was no difference in death. We were not powered for death, but the hazard ratio was very close to one. The curves were superimposable. And we didn't use drug-eluting stents in all patients. The little data we had with that generation of drug-eluting stents suggested that uh, if we had done the trial with all drug-eluting stents, there would have been no uh, difference. And um, we had a very strict definition of MI. So in fact, it, it, only six of the MIs, six out of these 2,200 patients, um, had uh, excess PCI-related MI. So it was not driven by periprocedural MIs in terms of these outcomes. And the hazard ratio for non-fatal MI was 1.25. Um, and actually, those reinfarctions were significant. If you reinfarcted an oat, your chance of death during follow-up was much higher than if you had not reinfarcted. So that was one confirmation. These patients had a lot of viability, which I will show you in, um, in a second. We looked up and down. I mean, my hypothesis was that opening these arteries was good. So we looked up and down, and these are all of the subgroups. Here are the LAD patients. Here's with uh, uh, an LAD stenosis. And this is med better on the right. No suggestion that LAD was going to benefit more than the other vessels. And prox LAD, we had 271. The hazard ratio was 1.58 for PCI versus med. We looked at those with and without collaterals. We looked by risk tertile, low, medium, and high risk. There was absolutely no signal of benefit in any subgroup. And we had ancillary studies also funded by NIH. Um, we had serial LV function measurements. And interestingly, we showed that the ejection fraction improved from baseline to one year in 66% of the patients in the ancillary study by at least five points to 73% of those 66. But the ejection fraction improvement from baseline to one year was the same for the PCI versus the med group in both the angiographic substudy and the nuclear viability substudy. The viability study confirmed that most patients, 70%, had at least moderately retained viability in the infarct zone, which is why they improved their ejection fraction and why, when they reinfarcted, it actually conferred an increased risk of death in the future. So these were not all just dead, dead, dead regions. And we looked at the, the few patients that had had stress testing, and we couldn't see any, whether they had ischemia that was mild to moderate or none, the hazard ratios looked very similar. So we dug in and we really couldn't see any subgroup that benefited. And the guidelines, as Jackie said, did change. Uh, not only the US guidelines, but the European Society of Cardiology guidelines changed to say that it is class three. Delayed PCI, totally included infarct arteries more than 24 hours post MI in stable patients. You should not do it. There's no benefit. Now, the other end of the spectrum, so this was really, the shock was the first trial I developed here. Um, a couple of years after arriving, I got an AHA grant to do a pilot of this, which Jerry Torino um, helped with. Um, the other end of the spectrum is cardiogenic shock, which is pump failure due to infarction of left ventricle, hypoperfusion, hypotension, elevated filling pressures. And uh, the upshot is that revascularization early as well as late post-MI reduces mortality. So I'll show you some of those data. So why do some patients go into shock, okay, with the same looking total occlusion of the infarct artery? Well, the risk region is important, collaterals, ischemic preconditioning, extent of coronary disease in the other vessels, 
prime myocardial dysfunction, systemic inflammatory response to MI, which we described and reported uh, here, once again, one of our fellows, uh, Mike Lee and Bennu, and metabolic milieu, hypoglycemia, hyper, uh, and, and uremia. So we missed the primary endpoint, which was 30 days. There was a difference of nine lives saved in emergency revascularization versus initial medical stabilization. The curves diverged over time, six months, 12 months, six years. We followed, we had an average of six-year follow-up. We followed out to 11 years. And the delta was remarkably consistent with 13 lives saved per 100 patients treated. And I challenge you to come up with any other treatment we have in cardiology that actually saves that many lives per 100 patients treated and is durable over 10 years on average of six years. It was quite amazing. Now, the implementation, the most rewarding thing for being a clinical trialist is that when you actually implement the results of the trial in the community, it makes an impact. And here, in fact, the implementation does translate into outcomes in the community. This is the Worcester heart attack study. This goes back to 1975. And the mortality rate back then was between 70 to 80 percent with shock. And you start seeing implementation um, of the results of the shock uh, trial, and you see mortality goes down. Here's another publication that picks it up in 2001 at 40 percent. It kind of bumps around. It goes down a little bit. So it's sort of a trend down here. But as you'll see, this is uh, 2011. The good news is that this de decreasing in hospital uh, death rates over time for acute MI complicated by cardiogenic shock, but we've reached a plateau. This is another data set uh, from uh, the ACC and CDR that shows that from 2003 to 2010, the, the dark bars are PCI, the light shaded bars are cabbage. There's a marked increase in the rate of PCI over time. The rate of cabbage is flat. In hospital mortality continued to go down between 2003 um, and 2010, but look where it is. The mortality is over 30% still. And if you look at a very recent report from a couple of years ago with 56,000 patients in ACC and CDR, of those patients selected to undergo PCI, the odds ratio, the adjusted odds ratio um, over this time period actually showed a slight increase. But if you look from 2005, 2014, this is flat. So the impact of PCI and cabbage was tremendous. People are getting it. Overall mortality rates are lower, but with revascularization now, the mortality rates are absolutely flat. So all the advances with drug eluting stents, with better um, anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents, we are stuck at that mortality rate. If you look at the shock trial, which was published in 1999, shock IABP, 2012, culprit shock, 2017, the 30-day mortality rate in PCI in several decades is absolutely flat. And we had a lot more left main than they have, actually. So we have a challenge. We're trying to improve mortality rates, so Holger Thiele in Germany tested the hypothesis that maybe we should do multi-vessel PCI for cardiogenic shock because these patients mostly have triple vessel disease. So this is culprit shock, and he showed that culprit only PCI is superior to multi-vessel PCI for shock complicating MI. And actually, that's the worst outcome. This is all-cause mortality for multi-vessel PCI versus culprit only. So we've now learned only do the culprit. And this is the one-year follow-up, multi-vessel PCI versus culprit. The curves stay divergent, but the risk is all up front. This is a landmark analysis, and the risk is all up front. So whatever's happening in the cath lab pretty much um, is not a good thing with all those interventions in the setting of cardiogenic shock. So if you go back to the shock trial, it was emergency revascularization versus initial medical stabilization, and then you could actually go to uh, surgery or PCI, and about half of the survivors in the initial medical stabilization group actually went on to revascularization. But in the invasive strategy, 
60% had PCI, 40% had urgent cabbage right away in shock. We had greatly cooperative um, surgeons. Dan Swistle is here. I don't know if you operated on any of our shock trial patients in shock. Did you? Okay, excellent. Okay, quite a few. And remarkably, the curves were superimposable. Outcomes were similar, despite the fact that the left main prevalence in the surgical group was 40% versus about 12% in the PCI group. Triple vessel disease was much more common, and they had twice the prevalence of diabetes. So these were higher risk patients, and the cabbage had a similar outcome. So I really think there's something there. And I have some young people, because you know I don't really want to run another shot trial, but I have some young people working on a trial, uh, we're in the early planning uh, stages for a cabbage shock trial with uh, MI patients uh, with cardiogenic shock and multivessel disease requiring at least one presser, elevated arterial lactate. They get randomized to infarct-related artery-only PCI with stenting versus multivessel cabbage. You can um, open the infarct-related artery with plain old balloon angioplasty in the cath lab, and the outcome will be all-cause um, mortality. So if you are all interested, St. Luke's, Roosevelt, and Mount Sinai in participating, uh, let me know. We have a survey you can fill out. So to conclude this portion about uh, early revascularization in cardiogenic shock, it is the only therapy proven to save lives. I didn't show you the balloon pump data, but Holger Thiele uh, did a randomized trial of intraortic balloon pumping versus um, no balloon pump in patients who get primary uh, PCI for cardiogenic shock. There's absolutely no benefit. And uh, time precluded talking about all the other temporary mechanical support devices, but suffice it to say that none of them have shown in the very small randomized trials done. There are now 95 patients in randomized trials of impella versus a balloon, and there's no difference in outcome. You know, underpowered, but so it remains to be seen. So there are 13 lives saved at six months per 100 patients treated. That's durable over 11 years. However, mortality rates remain high with PCI and further advances are needed. So that's the new frontier for you young people in the audience. So let's switch for the last portion and the largest portion of the talk to stable ischemic heart disease. So I've gone from the CCU more into the general population as I've gotten um, older in terms of what I'm studying. So the primary goals of treatment in stable ischemic heart disease, and when you think about it, anything we do in medicine, the primary goals are to improve survival or to improve quality of life, right? Patients really don't care if they have what's diagnosed as a myocardial infarction, et cetera. They really care about their quality of life, and they care about how long they're going to live. So these goals should govern management decisions, including whether and when to revascularize patients. So the ACC AHA guidelines have a class 1A recommendation that if you have at least one significant stenosis amenable to, to revascularization and you have unacceptable angina despite guideline-directed medical therapy, you should use revascularization. And the trial has nothing to do with retesting this. We are not retesting this. If you have, uh, if a patient has unacceptable angina despite maximal medical therapy, by guideline directed medical therapy that they can tolerate, you do revascularization. But the real question is, is there evidence that a routine strategy of prompt revascularization after you make the diagnosis of stable ischemic heart disease improves survival or reduces clinical events? So that regardless of their symptoms, you need to do something because you're going to prolong their life or reduce their, their chance of having a clinical event. So if you look back at the old literature in cabbage versus no cabbage, this is a, a meta-analysis putting together the VA study, which showed no difference, the coronary artery surgery study, which showed no difference, which actually uh, Early Cameron participated in here, CAS, and the European study, which was the one that showed a difference. And you could see if you put them all together, there's a statistically significant difference, 10 years, P of 0.03. But the relevance today is really unclear because there was minimal or no use of effective medical therapy. Not everybody was on aspirin. A minority were on aspirin. There were no statins. A minority were on beta blockers. There were no ACE inhibitors, let alone all the other medical therapies that we'll run through briefly. 
So in the era of intensive medical therapy, there are two landmark trials, Courage and Barry 2D. And you all know that in Courage, stable ischemic heart disease patients, PCI did not reduce the risk of death or MI, which was the primary endpoint. Here are the curves. There was a 33% PCI rate in the medical therapy group, which means that two-thirds of them never had it over the long term. And 21% in the PCI group needed repeat PCI. If you look at death, uh, all-cause mortality, not powered for it, but the curves, there's no suggestion that there's any benefit. And over the long-term follow-up, the probability of survival was absolutely the same after 12 years in the subset of the courage patients that went on to be followed in the long term. Barry2D was all diabetics. Um, with stable ischemic heart disease, they could be revascularized by any modality, cabbage or PCI. The primary endpoint was all-cause survival, uh, and there was absolutely no difference between the groups. At one year, 19% of the medical therapy group went on to need revascularization, and by the end of uh, five years, 42% went on to need it, so 58% never needed it. But what everybody has to understand about these strategy trials is that they are designed in clinically appropriate ways. You would never ever manage a patient by saying you can never get revascularization. You're assigned to no revascularization ever. I don't care what happens to you, you're not going to get it. These are strategy trials of upfront use of an invasive strategy versus see how you do and use it as clinically needed over time. And if you look at the, the patients in the PCI stratum, those who had anatomy suitable for PCI, those in the CABID stratum, Neither had any difference in terms of the primary endpoint, which was survival. In Barry 2D, there was a composite secondary endpoint of death MI and stroke. And in the CABID stratum, it looked like there were fewer MIs uh, than in the medical therapy group. The problem is there was no systematic assessment of peri cabbage MI. So they didn't measure any markers. They didn't systematically look for it. And I think that that's a problem with that trial. So what about FAME 2? So FAME2 was an FFR-guided PCI versus medical therapy in patients with coronary disease. They took 888 with stable coronary disease that were scheduled for getting a PCI with drug-eluting stent with one, two, or three vessel disease who met reduced coronary flow reserve criteria. They were randomized PCI in medical therapy or medical therapy alone. The primary endpoint was death MI or urgent revascularization, which you saw was not part of the, the endpoint. Encourage or Barry 2D. It was stopped early due to a reduction in the primary endpoint in the PCI group, and that difference was due to urgent revascularization rates. So something you need to know about this cohort. One out of three patients had recent unstable angina, which we are excluding in the ischemia trial. You cannot have had unstable angina in the last two months. Recent MI was not excluded. It was only excluded if they had an MI within seven days. We're excluding MI as, as uh, within the last two months before randomization. And one out of four patients had baseline class three to four angina, was scheduled for a PCI with a drug-eluting stent, and then told, you have rest angina, it's okay, but you're going to be assigned to medical therapy. I, I really don't know how they kind of designed that, kind of bizarre. The peri-PCI MI was defined as tenfold CKMB elevation, or five-fold CKMB and new Q-wave. Now, mind you, that's how we defined it in the ischemia trial, to make sure we were very conservative in calling peri-procedural MIs because of the concern by the interventionalists that, in fact, peri-PCI MIs really don't confer any increased risk and don't overcall them because that'll drive the trial results. So FAME 2, the primary endpoint was different. This is, these are two-year clinical events, 8.1 versus 19.5, but death from any cause, was no different, very low. Myocardial infarction, no different. Urgent revascularization, very different, and that drove the primary endpoint. Death or MI, no different. Death from cardiac causes, only three in each group. So the question is, why have these randomized trials not demonstrated a survival benefit for fixing the stenosis in stable ischemic heart disease? So the first point is that this is, there is a dissociation between angiographic or physiologic severity of a stenosis, 
and underlying atheroma and propensity to become a culprit lesion. I think we all know this and understand this now. We didn't understand it back in the old days. Atherosclerosis is a systemic disease with diffuse coronary involvement. And medical therapy has changed the underlying biology and natural history of atherothrombotic disease. It's a game changer. So here's a, a paradigm, and I took this from Peter Stone. A number of people have mocked this up. It's a paradigm that suggests why the randomized trials have not demonstrated a survival benefit for revascularization and stable ischemic heart disease. So the paradigm says that you can have severe obstruction with a fibrotic plaque, no lipid, and that's what it looks like in cross-section. That's what it looks like on the angiogram. And that gives you exertional angina, a positive exercise test. You treat it with anti angial medications, and if uh, they fail and you need to control uh, angina, use revascularization. On the other side, there are all these little lumpy, bumpy things, which represent a vulnerable plaque with minor obstruction, eccentric plaque, lipid pool, thin cap, eccentric uh, remodeling. And obviously, Valfusta's group has done a, a lot of work on this. That those rupture, that's the vulnerable plaque, and a vulnerable patient, it ruptures, thrombosis, causes acute MI and stable angina, and sudden death. And the way to treat those is pharmacologic stabilization. And the question is, what about early identification of these patients with these vulnerable plaques that are at high risk? And that's obviously an intensive uh, area of investigation at Mount Sinai. So the goals of secondary prevention and cardiac rehab programs are to improve survival and quality of life, to stabilize or reverse the progression of atherosclerosis, reduce the risk of MI, heart failure, and death, control symptoms, optimize the patient's psychosocial and ability to re uh, return to and perform at work. And the guidelines say that you use medical therapy for relief of symptoms, behavioral risk factor goals, physiologic risk factor goals, and pharmacologic therapy for secondary prevention. We struggle to do this in practice, but this is uh, critical. And recent studies that highlight the importance of optimal medical therapy are these, and I just show you some of them. So courage, this is the rate of patients that have had medicines optimized before elective PCI in the ACC and CDR CAF PCI registry of almost 500,000 patients. That was the rate. Courage was published, and that's the rate after. That's pretty depressing. So I urge you all to change this, make an impact. Syntax was a trial of cabbage versus PCI in patients with coronary disease. And um, in fact, the use of um, uh, optimal medical therapy, which consisted of antiplatelet, statin, beta block, ACE, and ARB, was better in the PCI patients, but it was only 50%. In the cabbage patients, it was about 30%, which is just really dismal. Um, I have to go through this. So if you look, though, at those patients in syntax that actually got optimal medical therapy, there was a 36% relative risk reduction across time, risk reduction in terms of all-cause death that was associated, not randomized, but associated with use of med medical therapy of five years. Look at that. Tremendous potential benefit. In the randomized trial part, there was only a 26% reduction with cabbage compared to PCI. So the apparent benefit of medical therapy was much greater, actually, than the difference in PCI and, and between PCI and cabbage, just emphasizing the importance of using medical therapy. Barry 2D also published very similar survival and cardiovascular outcomes. This is the average number of risk factors in the control um, compared to the reference value of six. If you have all six risk factors controlled, you had a hazard ratio of one for the risk of death. And if you had none or two or three, there was a graded effect with increased risk of death with less use of optimal medical therapy. And um, that's really the, the point of this slide. So here's the risk of death in relation to number of risk factors, sort of magnified, none, six, Six does best. Here are the risk factors. No smoking, non-HDL cholesterol less than 130, triglycerides less than 150, systolic pressure less than 130. They were ahead of their time. Diastolic less than 80, and hemoglobin A1C less than 
And since these trials, there have been major advances in medical therapy. So SPRINT showed that lower blood pressures to the target courage used actually improved outcomes. And PCSK9 inhibitors, use of DAPT in Pegasus, that was uh, Ticagrelor plus uh, aspirin in post-MI patients was better than aspirin alone. And I'll show you some others. So here's COMPASS. This was a mind-blowing trial to me. This was low-dose rivaroxaban added to aspirin in stable ischemic heart disease population. So picture all the patients out there. And they had over 27,000 patients. The primary endpoint was death, stroke, or myocardial infarction, hard endpoints. And rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice daily, plus aspirin, 100 milligrams, versus rivaroxaban alone, versus aspirin alone. It was stopped for superiority of the rivaroxaban plus aspirin group after a mean of 23 months of follow-up. So here's rivaroxaban plus aspirin, low-dose rivaroxaban, low-dose aspirin versus aspirin alone. Really a dramatic hazard ratio of 0.76. The FDA has just approved rivaroxaban for this use based on this trial. So a little bit of antiplatelets, a little bit of anticoagulants, you know, block kind of at a low level all the systems that make you thrombose, and it seems to be good. Odyssey was a PCSK9 trial of almost 19,000 patients, post-acute coronary syndrome, so this is not stable ischemic heart disease. Alarocamab versus placebo. Uh, death, MI, stroke, or unstable angina requiring hospitalization. So that's a softer endpoint, statistically significant, and obviously they have been FDA approved for use in people that are either statin resistant or statin um, uh, not sensitive. Don't get a response. Reduce it was another mind blowing trial. Uh, this is icosapentyl ethyl, which is like a, a fish oil uh, derivative. Um, in patients with a cardiovascular disease or diabetes or other major risk factors that are already receiving statins, they had uh, elevated triglycerides, but some of them were not very elevated at all, and it didn't seem to, uh, the treatment effect did not seem to differ by what your triglyceride level was. And they got two grams of this icosapentyl ethyl BID or placebo, and there was a hazard ratio of 0.74 for these very hard endpoints. And uh, it didn't matter how much fish you ate. <laughs> it didn't matter, uh, you know, what your levels of this were to start with, you know, sort of an indication of how much fish oil you have. Anyway, so for the ischemia trial, we asked, is there any high-risk group of stable ischemic heart disease patients other than left main stenosis in whom a strategy of routine revascularization improves outcomes in the era of modern medical therapy, which, by the way, is changing over time? Because I just showed you three trials that were all well after ischemia was mostly finished enrolling, right? So it's a moving target. So this is a landmark study from Cedar sinai looking at the log has ratio of death versus how much ischemia you had on a my stress myocardial perfusion imaging. So the more ischemia you have, the worse your outcomes are. Those who are clinically selected to undergo medical therapy only after showing 33% of the ventricle being ischemic had a worse outcome than those that were clinically selected to undergo revascularization. But the curves didn't cross till about 10% of ischemia. So there's no suggestion that if you take a patient with a little ischemia for revascularization, there's absolutely no data at all that you're going to benefit them. So that was a fundamental basis for doing the ischemia trial, understanding that ischemia is associated with worse outcomes in patients with stable ischemic heart disease. It's been thought to be um, a marker for a higher risk of death, but actually newer data challenged this. I don't have time to really go into it, but uh, the STITCH trial, which was ejection fraction less than 35%, uh, cabbage was superior over the long term to medical therapy, but that did not differ by what your ischemia baseline. All the patients seem to have the same relative risk reduction. So it's unclear whether that increased risk of death is related to adverse effects directly of ischemia, like you get ischemic and you drop dead, occlusion of severe stenosis, arrhythmias, or whether, in fact, 
More severe ischemia is a marker of atherosclerotic burden with more vulnerable plaques, which is definitely what I'm evolving to, 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 to think is the case, but we shall see. So prior strategy trials, landmark trials have made a major contribution. There were considerations to uh, address in further studies. It was, they were criticized because lower risk patients were included, but I remind you that the courage death and MI rate every year was 4%, 4% per year. There was referral bias, was a criticism by randomizing after seeing the anatomy in cardiac catheters in the cath lab, so we designed ischemia not to see the anatomy first. And revascularization procedures were not optimal, little drug eluting stents of third generation, no FFR use. So we asked, what's the best initial management strategy? What's the evidence that early revascularization improves lives? To answer these questions, NHLBI funded the ischemia trial. Stable patients with moderate severe ischemia determined by the site but read by a core lab. If they had low GFR or they had known anatomy, they could be randomized directly. Otherwise, they got a blinded CCTA, which the site did not know, the patient did not know, only the core lab, Jim Min, who's now at Cornell, knew. They were told either that the anatomy was ineligible, in which case they could use the CCTA clinically. That was a screen failure. Or if the anatomy was eligible, meaning they had at least one coronary with a significant stenosis, they got randomized to an invasive strategy where they got optimal medical therapy and went to the cath lab. So the conservative group never went to the cath lab up front. They just had optimal medical therapy with cath reserve to OMG failure, which was a major difference from Courage, Barry to d and Fame 2 The average follow-up will be 3.5 years. The primary composite is a composite of CV death MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, associated cardiac arrest, our key secondary endpoint is cardiovascular death or MI and angina and quality of life. These are the harder endpoints which we're most interested in. Ischemia CKD, Sripal Bangalore, who trained here, is the PI for the parallel trial that randomized patients with the same strategy but didn't get a CCTA if they had a low GFR less than 30 or were on dialysis. And Chow ischemia, Harmony Reynolds is the PI, those patients that after CCTA screen failed and had no obstructive disease despite moderate or severe ischemia. Very interesting group with presumably microvascular disease. So it's important to understand the trial population that was actually randomized. So if they had an unacceptable level of angina, despite maximum medical therapy, they could not get in. If they had class three angina or recent uh, um, onset of class three or angina of any class with a rapidly progressive or accelerating pattern, this trial will not apply to them. If they had class four angina, it won't. If they were very dissatisfied with medical management of angina, if they had left main on the CCTA or prior CCTA or CAF, if they had acute coronary syndrome or MI within the previous two months, they couldn't get in, or if they had PCR or cabbage within the previous year, they couldn't get in. We had 5,179 randomizations. I think that's a remarkable achievement. If you add up Courage and Barry 2D, we are larger than the two combined. Uh, CKD randomized 777 patients. It's an amazing number. This is the, the, the prior, only prior trial that randomized CKD patients to revask or not had 25 patients. So here's a consort diagram. We enrolled actually 8,518 patients. Our original target was 8,000 randomized. We enrolled that number, but in um, 5757 had a CCTA performed, but 339 were excluded because of insufficient ischemia. So the site may have said they had moderate or severe ischemia, but the core lab said, no, no. 1218 excluded because no obstructive disease. 434 for unprotected left main, not a very high percent, 8%. Um, and then there were various other reasons. So 5179 were randomized to an invasive or conservative strategy. We hope to present at the American Heart Association in November. It's a tight timeline. We have last patient, last visit at the end of June. So here are the baseline characteristics, which we published uh, in JAMA Cardiology uh, just in February of this year. So the average age is very typical for uh, SIHD population. Unfortunately, we underperformed in terms of recruitment of women, but women preferentially excluded because of no obstructive disease on CCTA. So Chow, Harmony study, 
grant enrolled 60% women. 41% were diabetic. So that's, that's a substantial number of diabetics. And the overall number that had stress imaging as opposed to exercise tolerance tests to, to qualify them was more than three quarters. Did the patient ever have angina? 90% had angina, 10% had silent ischemia. So they never had angina. Silent ischemia was fine for the trial. Uh, angina began or became more frequent over the past three months in about 30% of patients. Um, but I want to point out that in general, by the Seattle Angina questionnaire, these are mild angina patients. Remember, we excluded them if they had angina refractory to medical therapy. So this was our intent. Uh, here are the, the um, core lab readings of the degree of ischemia. 54% had severe ischemia, 33% moderate. Some, the, the, the site was allowed to proceed uh, before the core lab read it. So we have 7% mild, 5% none, 1% uninterpretable. But that's a hell of a lot of ischemia in a lot of patients, 5179. Remarkably, the, the CCTA uh, findings were quite significant. 45% had triple vessel disease. Only 23% had single vessel disease. And LAD was 87%, Prox LAD 47%. So we, our sites randomized the target number of patients. And Jackie Tamas led uh, the effort here. Um, in randomizing patients, um, and I thank her for that. So, in conclusion, the optimal the, the, what is the management of stable ischemic heart disease pending the results of the trial? Optimize medical therapy and lifestyle changes. The role of revascularization is there for significant left main disease, angiogram refractory to medical therapy. <clears throat> Patient is dissatisfied with quality of life on their medicines or moderate or more ischemia is to be determined. I hope to have the answer for you at the American Heart Association meeting. Now, clinical trials really require teamwork. I had a lot of teamwork here at St. Luke's when we were running uh, the shock trial and uh, the first half of OAT. Unfortunately, I didn't have any pictures. <laughs> so um, here are, is my team at the NYU Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center. Here are some of the faculty um, of the Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center. And you remember Sripal, who trained here for many years, uh, a, big, uh, uh, a big achiever, a big success. And we had um, ischemia research teams all over the world, uh, 350 research teams. Here is our uh, staff at the Clinical Coordinating Center, a little blurry. Here's the Duke Clinical Coordinating Center. Here's our top recruiting site in the United Kingdom, randomized over 200 patients at, at the Royal Brompton in Northwick Park. My study co-chair, David Marin from uh, Stanford, and lots of other teams. Here's our Polish team. So once again, it's, it's terrific to be back here. The place looks great. It's kind of uh, spiffed up since uh, I was here last. And of course, most, most importantly, it's, it's um, a privilege and a pleasure to be here to honor uh, Miles, who, as I said at the beginning, maybe before Kathy came in, was really the heart and soul um, of this uh, division and part of the attraction of me to uh, St. Luke's and allowed me to work with so many uh, very, very talented fellows mm -hmm. who I'm sure are practicing up to Miles' standards you know, out there, where they actually are clinicians and not just testers and doing procedures. And my message for the young people is to find somebody that can, you know, really teach you to do that, to be a thinking uh, clinician and not just, you know, ordering tests and procedures. And thanks for having me, and I look forward to seeing many of you at the memorial service. <laughs> Questions, Dave? <laughs> so, uh, Judy, first of all, thank you for uh, agreeing to come and give this lecture when I asked you to do that. None of this would have existed had you not agreed to come and 
we have a Miles in the Shenway, and everybody here, and we are incredibly grateful uh, for your comment, but I give also. So you showed the study by uh, by Vera Bittner uh, that looked at very to be and, and Bittner Mary showed the same thing when you looked at courage. That it really doesn't matter whether you're masquerade, but how well not only you get the right medicine, but you exercise, you eat a heart healthy diet, you lose weight, and things like that. Has there been any thought to doing a study where you start with lifestyle risk factor modification and then looking for ischemia and randomizing these people based on ischemic burden once you've accomplished the most important things? And the second part of that is where do we get the time, money, and effort yeah. to accomplish what we really need to do, which is optimal? Right. So great, great question. So I'll start with the first one. So I'll, I'll answer that indirectly in two ways. Um, we are prospectively looking at, as an important subgroup, it's predefined, those that were randomized but had already achieved their physiologic targets, you know, LDL, blood pressure, use of aspirin, go down the list. And it's a very interesting question to see whether their hazard ratio, you know, their point estimate will be similar to those that started off at baseline not achieving it. And David's in charge of that. David Marin's in charge of that analysis. The second part of that is Ray Gibbons uh, wrote an editorial in association with the baseline characteristic papers. I'll just make a comment first. How many of you seen, have, you, have you seen an editorial in association with a, a, a trial design paper? Like, they don't exist, but when, when the ischemia trial design was published in the American Heart Journal, there was an editorial in, a, in association with it uh, by somebody who does stress imaging that was very upset that we included regular treadmill tests. So, it's interesting, everybody's got their vested interests. And it, when the baseline characteristics were published, which are just like baseline characteristics, there was an editorial in association with it. So, it's like this trial is, you know, getting a lot of attention, but Ray Gibbons pointed out that the prevalence of moderate severe ischemia and stress tests is going way down. And that's one of the reasons we had trouble recruiting for the trial. You know, maybe 3 to 5 percent of all stress tests done have that much ischemia, and probably even less now. And he attributed it to use of medical therapy, more widespread use of medical therapy. So I think there's, there's no doubt that optimizing medical therapy reduces the amount of inducible ischemia. Yes? Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, question that I have is about two parallel concepts that are emerging in the field of coronary artery disease. Uh, one is ischemia by myocardium, and the other one is a region specific ischemia by myocardium. What we are learning is that and what we've learned, as you showed, uh, this uh, Magamovich paper is that if you have myocardium at risk, there might be then a revascularization. At the same time, when we are having uh, data on lesion specific, Neil Johnson and others show that if you reach a threshold of 1.67, independent of your myocardium at risk, you might actually have benefit from revascularization. So the question is, uh, with ischemia result, whatever it will be, would it actually answer the question of lesion at risk, or is it all about the myocardium at risk? And if not, should we need another trial for that? So thank you. I, I, I hope I can answer your question directly. You'll, you'll come back and say whether I haven't or not. But there, there, you can have ischemia to differing degrees based on an epicardial stenosis, and the more severe, the, you know, by FFR, the more, you know, that th that would theoretically need intervention, right? There's also microvascular ischemia, right? So Marcello Di Carli has published that ischemia at the microvascular level, regardless of what's happening in the epicardial coronaries, is highly prognostic. We don't know how to treat that, really. But I will tell you that um, one of the challenges in clinical trials, I'll tell you right now, we don't need another trial, okay? One of the challenges in clinical trials is uh, heterogeneity of the population you're recruiting. 
So even though we have strict criteria, you know, we have exclusion criteria, we have inclusion criteria, you have to go through a core lab to say how much ischemia, we're going to look at the subset that the core lab said you had moderate severe ischemia. We have the CCTAs on 75% of patients. I mean, that is enormous. And everybody that went to the invasive strategy that had a calf, the Angio Core Lab at CRF, Greg Stone, is reading all of them. Well, he's not. CIRLE is reading them. So we're going to have a tremendous amount of data and, and patient subsets to drill into, right? So that's critical to learn from. However, every subset is underpowered. So yes, theoretically, you could take a subset and say, ah, I think that's the ideal subset if the trial doesn't come out that the way somebody wants it and they want to look at a subset where it may come out differently, they could then say, I'll take that to a full-scale trial. But good luck <laughs> achieving that. And I'll tell you, I have a whole slide deck, which I give a lecture in the clinical trials course, about the number of trials that have a subgroup benefit, apparently, or have one of the secondary endpoints looks like it's beneficial. They then go on to do a full-scale trial, and it's 99.9% .9 never confirmed. Yes? What's your name? My name is Amir Hunt. Um, so, the follow-up to that is that do you think, with regards to the decision to be vascularized, is the myocardium at risk more important, or is the lesion itself? Which means that if you have a lesion, so we're going we're gonna to look at anatomy versus ischemia. That is a major, you know, the Courage published that it was not ischemia that was in the, the array of ischemia that was independently associated. It was anatomy. And Jim Min, with all the CCTA data, all the CCTA people are totally convinced that it's anatomy that's prognostic and not ischemia. We are definitely going to go up and down looking at that. That's critical. Norma. more about process and how it can be distinguished. Uh, in experimental smoking, you can look at coronary vessels literally actively contracting when the cigarette smoke with all its constituents are due. So the question is, is angina due to vascular reactivity versus anatomy and flow under stress conditions? And can you distinguish that and determine whether that contributes to this lack of alleged improvement with the various uh, aggressive things. The other is, I think, of the coronary artery disease because it reflects a life of behavior, um, nutrition, activity, etc., and genes. And we, we take a surgery of PCI, which is like a snapshot. And to me, it doesn't surprise me at all that you don't really have a major difference because we're not changing the event mm -hmm. leading to that mm -hmm. snapshot. And so the question is, and I think they alluded to this, is uh, how do you then make lifestyle changes? The obesity. I forgot to answer that question. Enormous, <laughs> and it keeps continuing to rise. And, uh, and despite that, people are still living longer. So something's right, but what's not right? And, how do we approach this? Yeah. Separating it. Yeah. So thanks. I'll answer the second question first. Remind me to come back to the first, and then it's, it's also going to answer David's, which I sort of um, ignored. So yes, absolutely. So I showed a slide with that paradigm, and clearly it's, it's, it's lifestyle changes, medical therapy have changed the underlying biology of the disease, right? If you, you know, and our diets are better now, and less people are smoking. So, you know, there's no doubt that's one of the reasons people are, are, are living longer. But how you get, but we're, we're now at a critical point, right, where obesity and type 2 diabetes are increasing. And how do you get people to make lifestyle changes? So we know that on an individual level, we're not reimbursed for counseling, right? So it's a, it's a major challenge. We're reimbursed for doing tests and procedures. So we need a major overhaul to that. But I think one of the answers really is the food industry. I mean, I think this is a public policy issue. I think that if we don't work with the food industry in terms of, you know, them making their profits but serving, you know, less salt, for example, it's impossible to get low-salt food. 
you know, even if you go to a fancy restaurant, it's possible to get low salt food. So I think working with the food industry is 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 critical. Now, in terms of vascular tone, absolutely. So this frank spasm, right? We know that. We know that's a syndrome. It's more common in women than men. It's more common sort of perimenopausal. In Japan, they see more exercise-induced spasm than we do. We don't usually see exercise-induced spasm. So we know a lot about spasm. But beyond spasm, there are changes in coronary tone. And if you have an eccentric lesion and then you have a change in tone, that can become very flow-limiting, right, when it was not flow-limiting before. And there were nice studies published two decades ago looking in the New England Journal, actually, I think uh, Peter Gans, pub- I'm sure Peter Gans published this, where they took patients, gave acetylcholine in the cath lab, saw some sort of diffuse vasoconstriction, not per se spasm, but diffuse vasoconstriction, treated them with statins, brought them back, and could abolish that, right? You didn't get the diffuse vasoconstriction, you got what you're supposed to get, which is vasodilation. So we know the coronary tone plays a big difference in medications, diet, um, your LDL level plays a, plays a role in that. Talk and just to put my uh, perspective here, I was uh, one of the first residents in three years here in the CCU way back when. So uh, I'm just glad to hear your thoughts about uh, cardiology and all these past uh, decades of research. Is it kind of a, in, in the field, in the trenches, cardiologist? I just want to ask you what your thoughts about how the has changed over the years. And uh, you can draw the laws talking about with how we started we're going towards global cardiology and how we learn more about how we have to put it in right to the healthy. So my question really is in terms of the patients we have kind of with statement student heart disease, maybe two groups, ones that have had, let's say, uh, angina and they've been treated with sense and they seem to be stable right now and they have no angina, versus those that are being treated with optimal medical therapy that do have angina, we do some of beta blockers and uh, our other uh, anti medications, uh, nitrates, and plus the estrogen. So the roles of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, and those groups that are just chronically stable, they've had their stents, they have, let's say, a 30, 40, 50, even 60 percent lesion, it's really not flow limiting, they have no uh, no engine at this point in time, other than the statins, uh, other than the aspirins, BCK, inhibitors, if you need them, uh, maybe you want to uh, run to the man. Uh, what is the role then nowadays with using even ACE inhibitors? We've shown that the that's, uh, so that's a great question, and I'll, I'll answer the ACE inhibitor one first. So, you know, as you know, Europa and HOPE tested ACE versus no ACE in patients with stable ischemic heart disease and presumably preserved ejection fraction, although they didn't measure it in every one and showed a benefit, okay? Heart endpoints were reduced with ACE. The PEACE trial, which was then U.S. with some international um, patients, was a, in general a low-risk cohort and did not show a benefit of ACE in patients with stable ischemic heart disease and preserved DF. So we have sort of conflicting data, and where the guidelines have come out is to say, if you have hypertension, you know, diabetes, low ejection fraction, post-anterior MI, use ACE. You know, that's a class one. For all the others, it's sort of a class 2A. Like, you know, it's, it's dealer's choice. I don't think anybody's going to rete- re- retest that, though, because ACE, you know, with its renal protection, with the prevalence of hypertension and diabetes in our patients, you know, I don't think there's any motivation to retest that. So you sort of would individualize. Beta blockers is a different story, right? Beta blockers have sort of a lot of side effects that patients don't like. And the data, or we don't have that same kind of data that we have for ACE. The data are all in the pre-reperfusion, you know, era, in patients with big infarcts. And Sripal Bangalore has been passionate about this question. And he's published a lot with Franz Meserly, who is here, about questioning the role of beta blockers in patients with whole range, you know, hypertension, stable ischemic heart disease. And he has submitted as of a year and a half ago and then revised an application 
to NIH to do an 8,500 patient randomized trial of stable ischemic heart disease beta blocker or no. So stay tuned. And if he actually gets funding, we'll want all of your sites uh, to participate because it's a very important question. Thank you for asking. Stage. So, Dr. Hockman, we're so grateful to you both for your um, remarkable contributions to the field and also for your presence with us today and for the delightful uh, walk down memory lane, as you called it, and uh, the storied history of this institution as it relates to so many patients who struggle with heart disease. And we have small tokens of our gratitude. This is a blue bag that we wow. all recognize from Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a plaque, the Miles J. Schwartz. This is the inaugural Miles J. Schwartz Memorial Lecture with our gratitude to Judith S. Hockman for her dedication to teaching, devotion to patient care, and contributions to the field of cardiovascular medicine. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this is going to be one of the most meaningful plaques that I'm going to put up on my wall. It'll remind me of Miles uh, every day. Thank you. You're welcome.